I am once again coming to you to talk about your idiot league mates in fantasy football. Six players that your idiot league mates are going to waste early round picks on in drafts this year. And do not forget, our season-long draft guide is available for pre-order right now on bdge.co, but the easiest and the least expensive way to get it is via our homies over at PrizePicks, prizepicks.com or download their app. Link is in the description. And if you use promo code BDGE when you deposit just $10, you're getting $10 to play with, a 100% deposit match, plus the free draft guide, which will be emailed over to you. Six players that your idiot league mates are going to waste early round picks on. Let's tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling. Let's eat. We're actually going to go round by round here, all right? We're going to go with the first round, the second round, the third round. We're just going to go round by round by round until we hit maybe round five or six. I think those are still kind of considered early round picks, if you ask me. But it's what I'm doing. So anything you ask me, I'm going to be doing it correctly. The first player in the first round that you should not be drafting, that you should let your idiot league mates waste an early, early pick on is Najee Harris of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, listen, Najee came in first round NFL draft capital. That's legit for an NFL player. And he was every bit the player that the Steelers needed at the time and drafted him to be. He had a great rookie year. And I wouldn't be surprised if we saw something similar to the rookie year that Najee had. But now you're paying the premium for it. He's going ahead of guys like Dalvin Cook. I would never, ever, ever take Najee Harris over Dalvin Cook in a 2022 fantasy football draft. But when you can objectively look at the situation and we start to pick apart what his year was last year, there was not a lot of efficiency. There was not a lot of explosive plays. And I've dropped this stat a few times and it's just something that a lot of people forget. But that week three game against Cincinnati, Najee Harris saw 19 targets, had 14 catches. He basically had like a quarter of all of his receiving work, which when you look back at the box score and the the entire season and the statistics from the season, they were really impressive. A lot of it came in that game. Okay, something that's probably not repeatable, especially not when you take a look at what they did this offseason. They took George Pickens early. They drafted Calvin Austin, who is going to be a guy that operates in the short area of the field. Pat Fryermuth is going to take another step forward as well in this offense. So you're talking about a lot of really good, talented weapons. They're going to eat into the target share all around. And now you have uh, some kind of quarterback battle between two guys that we don't even know if we can actually trust at the NFL level. I like Kenny Pickett. What I saw on film, I liked. There's no telling whether or not he's going to be the actual starter here in Pittsburgh. If it's Mitch Trubisky, if it's Kenny Pickett, you have a below average NFL quarterback, most likely spreading it out to like five legit pass catching weapons. The target totals for Najee Harris are going to come way down this year. Their offensive line overall ranked 30th in the NFL. That's what PFF has them going into 2022. And again, like the the lack of explosiveness tells me that like he needs an insane volume total to get there. And they're already talking about probably peeling back his workload a little bit. But if you look at last year among 50 running backs with more than 100 carries, Najee's 15 plus yard carry rate. So the percentage of his carries that went for 15 or more yards, 2.8%. That was 41st among 50. So the overall message here is I think Najee Harris, he's getting drafted like seventh or eighth overall. I think he'll finish as like the RB9 or so, you know, in the RB9 to 10 to 11 range. You need someone at that premium of a pick that actually helps you win your league. Like he'll be a staple for your fantasy football team, but he's like one of those staples that, you know, he'll be able to get through like 10 or 12 sheets of paper, but you want one of those rock hard motherfuckers that will get through 20, 30, 40 sheets of paper. And I just don't think Najee Harris is that for you this year in fantasy football. In the second round and kind of overlooting into the third round are both of the Miami wide receivers that are the staples of their offense. Okay. We have Tyree Kill, newly coming over, and we have Jalen Waddle, who came in as a rookie like Najee Harris and was dynamite last year, at least on a volume basis, on a per touch, per reception, per route run basis. He really wasn't that good. He was a short yardage guy that ate up target after target after target, which, you know, the volume eventually leads to a lot of fantasy points. That's what we saw last year. I think there's a real chance both of them go over a thousand yards. Okay. I think there's a chance that like Waddle finishes between 950 and 1050 and then Tyreek Hill finishes between like 1050 and 1100 yards, something like that. But man, I'm not paying 
Tyreek Hill is a second round pick right now. I'm not paying second round draft capital for a guy that I personally think is going to finish between 1,050 and 1,100 yards. I'm not paying third round draft capital, which is where Jalen Waddle is going, for a guy that I think is going to hover around 1,000 yards. You guys don't believe me when I say this, but 1,000 receiving yards is pretty replaceable in fantasy football. And when we look at the rest of the team, yes, they improved. They added some pieces to the O-line. There's a chance that Tua takes a big step forward. There's a chance that Tua is just toast. Like what realistically is the upside in terms of like passing touchdowns in this offense? Like is Tua all of a sudden going to throw for 33 passing touchdowns? If that's the case, then yeah, I would love to draft a guy like Jalen Wilder, or Tyree Kill because they'll probably get a decent amount of volume and then you have some touchdown upside. I think there's a better chance that Tua finishes with like 18 to 20 touchdowns than there is 28 to 30 touchdowns. And if you're spreading 18 to 20 touchdowns around between you know, Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle. I think they they brought in Cedric Wilson and uh, Mike Kosicki and yeah, Chase Edmonds. Like they got enough going on there that I'm not sure enough about the quarterback that he's going to be able to spread it out at a high volume. I think there's going to be a run first offense. That's why they brought in 75 different running backs. Chase Edmonds, Sony Michelle, Raheem Mostert, right? Mike McDaniel coming in there already knows them. So it's like there's too many things happening here for me to actually think that any one guy has a ton of upside in this offense. Therefore, I'm going to pass on them in premium picks because I just don't think they have any ceiling here. It's kind of the case for most of these guys, man. I just don't see a lot of ceiling. And that's the case for the third guy on this list. Also going in the third round at the back of the third round is David Montgomery, the Chicago Bears running bite. This offense is just bad, man. And I went on the uh, Fantasy Pros podcast a few weeks ago, and one of the dudes on there, one of the hosts of the show, Andrew Erickson, was dropping some numbers on us. I believe the stat was, I'm not sure if I know this perfectly off the top of my head, but it was like David Montgomery finished outside of the top 24 fantasy running backs in half of his games last year. It's really not that hard to finish inside the top 24 running backs on a weekly basis. Like, think about that, right? You're watching Red Zone, probably two or three teams on a bye. All you need to do is not be one of the worst five starting running backs in the NFL for fantasy to finish inside the top 24. There's only 32 teams. Most of them are on a bye. So 24 running backs, right? Of course, a couple teams, whatever. You guys get the fucking point. Half of his games, he finished outside the top 24 running backs. He just wasn't efficient when he got the volume either, right? He had six games, six games last year where he carried the ball 20 or more times. Those resulted in rushing totals of 61, 106 and 90, 45, 64, and 72 rushing yards. I also think that the fact that like Tariq Cohen got hurt, you know, or he basically had like a career ending injury in like his second or third year. His role was very clear in this offense. And David Montgomery has clearly benefited from that really serious injury that Tariq Cohen had. I think they wanted to have a pass catcher in the situation. They brought in Darrington Evans, man. And Darrington Evans was never a guy that I loved from a rushing standpoint. He was always undersized, 5'10", 203 pounds, but he's a really explosive athlete and he can play on third downs. He can be a very, very good pass catcher. If you look at his profile, man, he's athletic. He's got the size to be like that Tariq Cohen type player, best comparable to Darrell Henderson. I think Darrington Evans is going to be a little bit of a wrench in David Montgomery's outlook this year. If he's not getting the pass catching to a level that he was the previous years, that stuff's going to come down a little bit. Not to mention that they have the second worst offensive line, 31st ranked offensive line entering the year via PFF. There's also a chance that Justin Fields just isn't good, right? He might be good, but I don't think he's going to be good this year. They don't have any weapons. They have a terrible offensive line. New, yeah, I know it's a new system, but like it's going to take a minute for him to get acclimated to it, right? And last year was not a good sign for why we think he might be good this year, right? Just too many red flags for the Chicago Bears overall, for David Montgomery, for me to get excited about a guy who I wasn't excited about to begin with. So Demont kind of feels like a discount Najee Harris, but Najee Harris was at a price that I wasn't even trying to open my wallet for. So let's move on to the fifth player on this list, I believe. That is Deontay Johnson going in the fourth round, the wide receiver from the Pittsburgh Steelers. If you're buying Deontay Johnson in the fourth round, you're literally just buying him based on what he's done last year or the previous two years. You're not buying him based on what you think he's going to do this year. And I hate to put him on this list because he's such a good player. He's such a good route runner, but ain't no fucking way I'm using my fourth round pick on him. This is just simply too much. There's too much stock in the in the Steelers offensive players for an unknown at quarterback plus a really shitty offensive line. And it's going to hurt everyone. At this point, it's like, yeah, maybe I'll just take I don't like Chase Claypool, man. I feel like he was he took a huge step back last year. But at this point, give me Chase Claypool in like the 10th round over Deontay Johnson in the fourth round. Like the, the chemistry between Deontay Johnson and Ben was was real, man. And I, I'm not sold that we see him getting force fed targets like he did in previous years. And on a per target, like per, you know, route run, per uh, reception basis, Deontay Johnson was not very much like Waddle. He was a volume player last year. And when you don't have the same quarterback, you don't know if you're going to get the same volume, right? And again, same point with them. The touchdown upside, I would say, is even lower in Pittsburgh than it is in Miami in a very severely limited 
downfield passing offense. Johnson, you know, he's a specimen at wide receiver. If you put him, you put him in an offense with a top 10 quarterback right now, he would be a top 10 fantasy wide receiver. I would say he, he might finish closer to top five than top 10 if that were the case, but it's just objectively not the situation for him right now. So Johnson's a guy that's easily, he, he's off my board unless he drops into like the sixth, maybe, yeah, sit like end of sixth round ish, that area. The last player on this list who I've talked about, like ad nauseum this offseason, who is still sitting in the fifth round is Antonio Gibson, man. Been yelling about this for like two fucking months, but continue to let your idiot league mates draft Antonio Gibson in the fifth round. He is not who we wanted him to be coming out of college. He may be that guy in a year, in two years, when J.D. McKissick is out of Washington or he moves to a different team or whatever the case may be. McKissick's taking the pass catching role. Brian Robinson's going to take a lot of short yardage and goal line role. And that's really the only reason Gibson was even relevant last year was because he was scoring a ton of fucking touchdowns on the goal line. If he starts sharing that work, he has very little going for him outside of literally just being a dynamite athlete and us seeing how good he was catching the ball in college. The situation is so clear and objective that he is not going to be a workhorse this year. He's going to be in a committee in an offense that's probably not going to be very good. So Antonio Gibson, very much off my board in the fifth round. He would have to drop to like the seventh, eighth round in order for me to actually even think about pulling the trigger on this man. And the last video I did that was similar to this, it was seven players to let your idiot league mates draft in 2022. And it was, you know, throughout the entirety of the draft, not just early round picks. I had DJ Moore in there. And then after the Baker Mayfield trade happened, naturally, I got 8,000 comments saying this is going to, you know, age poorly or like just asking, you know, what's my opinion on DJ Moore now that Baker Mayfield is in Carolina. And I think I talked about it on Saturday's mock draft, but obviously this is an upgrade for DJ Moore, right? Baker Mayfield has shown, he's shown his highs of highs. He's shown his lows of lows, but in a vacuum, so, so is Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield. Every bit of that is better with Baker Mayfield. The highs are higher. The lows are probably higher there. He's shown glimpses where he can be a very accurate, short, intermediate passer. And that's where DJ Moore sells on the field. So DJ Moore is not, and he's no longer uh, a complete fade for me. I will be drafting him at where his ADP is. I'm not going to be reaching for him now, right? He's not someone that I'm like in love with, but I hated him before. This makes me like him a little bit more. You know, if I'm if I'm in six fantasy leagues, maybe I draft him in one or two of them. He's not a complete fade for me. Like him more with Baker Mayfield. And that'll wrap up today's video. We will be bike tomorrow, though, with another fantasy video. Um, I love y'all. Make sure you go cop the draft guide either on bdg.co or through prize picks. Prize picks is easily the way to go with that, though, but it's just not available in all 50 states. So I want to make sure everybody can get their greasy fingers on it. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. And, uh, and yeah, we'll see you tomorrow.